So we have Jess here. Jess Peck is a technical SEO and engineer who likes building weird web things <laughs> and good websites. She's done analytics at CVS and SEO at Stone Temple. And now she makes machine learning tools internally at Local SEO Guide. Now, Local SEO Guide, if you haven't heard of it, is an all remote SEO agency. You want to do SEO audits, longer content, and technical engagement, despite the name. They're very good at what they do. And honestly, when it comes to internal SEO tooling, I've always been talking with Andrew Shotland and Dan, and they've always, they're always questioning me on all these like new crazy ideas they have surrounding, you know, BERT, machine learning, n-gram analysis, digesting a website. And so I think this is going to be a great talk. It's going to be very technical. And I'll pass the mic over to you, Jess. Yeah. Um, hi, everyone. It's nice to be here. We we obviously really like ClearScope because we're very up on using tools to kind of understand content. Um, and so for this presentation kind of thing, we're going to talk about um, what an internal tools team kind of brings to the table how internal tools team work tools teams work um, and how to kind of talk to devs and then we're going to talk a bit more about uh, if you as a solo seo or a solo co content seo should get into development um, and kind of wider questions about how tools and SEO kind of work together and when they don't work together. Uh, so uh, I'm obviously pretty biased because I work on an internal SEO tool team like with DevOps. Uh, but I do think if you're an agency level, it's super useful to have a team of people who understand engineering and coding and things like that because SEO is a land of many tools like we have a lot of stuff to analyze a lot of data but having a group of people who can take all that data and pipeline it together and make it all make friends easily can really speed up processes and find patterns that you wouldn't be able to find just as a solo kind of SEO, like pulling your SEM rush report, pulling your crawl data, pulling your clear scope data, and looking at those in different spheres. Um, and so a lot of what we do is create stuff that our SEO analysts need and facilitate kind of ease of use with vendor tools that and create interfaces for APIs and that kind of thing. So that our analysts can just focus on doing the thing they're really good at, which is analyzing stuff. Uh, so like the nice thing about having a squad out here doing this stuff is APIs and data tend to be made available to developers in a different way than they are to just people who use a tool interface. Often APIs can call more data. We, I mean, if you think about like the Google's new URL expect, inspection API, we're all complaining about the number, the limit on that. But still, it's probably easier to uh, run that and get 600 responses in an hour than it is to like go and manually hit the URL inspection tool in Google Search Console by hand. Um, but it's annoying. If you don't know how to code, how can you access it? Having a pal who is a developer access it, create an interface for it, and make it easy to grab, that's kind of the way to go. And I think also having an internal tools team can be useful when you have an external vendor because they can kind of talk to each other on a level. And so you can kind of, they can be like, hey, this is what we need explicitly. This is what our analysts need. And then the external vendor can be like, oh, we can do that. They understand how that process might come together. Um, so like 
an example of how this works would be you have access to Google Search Console, you have access to SEM Rush, and you can use a tool that your internal tools team has made to mash all that data together and then get new insights from links and from the link information you get from these two sources, right? So I wanted to include a bit here about how to talk to your developers, uh, some, some handy hints. Um, I think one thing that a lot of SEOs tend to feel is, I'm not gonna say anxiety, but like imposter syndrome when they talk to developers. I think a lot of SEOs who aren't big into development kind of see it as like, math witchcraft I see a lot of SEOs be like I don't know how to talk to the devs they I feel like they're going to dismiss me so I wanted to include some some of my top tips which is most devs are actually really interested in SEO they've just not spent time thinking about it uh, they might push back if you come with an SEO suggestion but that's usually just like them wanting to know why or like cycling through like if I were a develop like if I were developing Google why would I want it to be like this so I think the pushback if you get pushback from a developer a lot of the time it's just them looking for a why right um and I think I wanted to kind of say I think if you're looking for a new feature or tool from either a vendor or your internal tools group or even yourself, this is the kind of question I would ask myself, um, would be to go about it where you think about what you want to put into this tool and what you want to get out of it. And then think about how much effort it would be to create that tool versus the time it would save you. And I think this is like the rule for toolification for all things websites is if, you are doing something and it is really boring and it is really monotonous and it's really repetitive, you can automate it pretty much always. If you're doing something and you have to think, it's probably a better idea to keep thinking and not rely on a machine because machines make mistakes very easily, right? Um, developers aren't scary. There are a bunch of dorks. Uh, but they will go down rabbit holes. I go down rabbit holes all the time by accident. Uh, someone asked me about links the other day and I started talking about the page rank pattern in front and I had to be like reeled back in. Like if you, uh, I have had multiple conversations with devs. Um, when I was back at Stone Temple, I also worked with the internal tools team. And occasionally we would be like, why does Google do this? And then we would kind of go down this like tunnel of like trying to figure it out. And then it was like eight o'clock at night and we needed to go home. We were like, well, <laughs> this meeting had an extra three hours, I guess. Like, so sometimes you can kind of guide people back on the, on the path of just getting through stuff, right? Yes, I have a question about yeah. about that. Is like you've talked about some some of the right ways. You know, I work with my internal product team very closely. But what about some of the wrong ways to ask for development help internally? You know, what are some of the more egregious errors and mistakes that kind of rub you the wrong way? And, you know, what should people avoid doing when it comes to asking for help? Uh, I think being vague um, and kind of assuming that people know what you want as a result. I think those are the big, they're not necessarily really annoying, but I have seen a lot of experiences where someone will be like, <laughs> Uh, I want a tool that gets all of these links and they won't specify what the output table they want is and they won't specify like how, how they want it to be 
interpreted at the end. And so you end up, and then they won't check in and the developers don't check back in because they're like, oh, I know what they want. Or I think I know what they want, so I'll just build it. And then at the end, they have built something that the original requester doesn't actually want because there wasn't that communication there, right? Right. Yeah, there wasn't um, that clarity in like exactly the inputs and outputs and and then yeah. We have a question yeah. from the audience. Jerry asks, in my experience, devs would create something that functionally works, but the program exists in some esoteric platform and the user interface is too user unfriendly for non-technical SEOs. Is it too much to ask a dev to make the UI more friendly, even though my initial ask has been satisfied? I think this is a really good question. Um, I agree. I think it's, I don't think it's too much to ask at all. Um, I've worked with tool, like worked on toolification in a couple of different places and UX is always a struggle. It's always a like, because I think if you were building something yourself, you kind of get into this, like, I understand what all these buttons mean, so it's fine. Um, or you kind of want it to look smooth or you want it to, or you've just gotten it to work and you're like, it works, it's fine, get out of here, right? Um, so I think it can be, you as long as you're specific about how you think the UX could be more friendly or if you kind of come at it from the for example like um i've worked on a crawler before an internal crawler and we had a button that was like follow no follows and people were always tripping over whether selecting that button would follow no follows or deselecting it would follow no follows right and like, what does that even mean? Does that mean it's going to like count in this way? Are we like, how are we justifying it X or Y, right? Um, and we ended up just adding a tool tip with like a full explanation of like, if you select it, it will do exactly this um, because that was more useful. But we only came about to improving that UX after we talked to the SEOs who were using the tool, who were like, I, you need to be more specific here. Um, so that was a very long answer with an example in it, but uh, I really think if you don't understand the UX, the tool isn't complete. Um, I think going in and being like, hey, here is the, here is the problem I'm having, I don't know understand this or I think this could be more clear uh like sometimes you'll get devs who are kind of like oh it's just it's just UX what's the problem uh -huh. but a lot of the time UX tweaks tend to I'm not going to say be easy but at least making things more specific can be yeah I've personally found that just opening up a, a Google Slides and like literally just drawing boxes and like little lines and being like, oh, you know, like I would want the output to be graphed like in this box in this way. And then sending that along with the, the request to be at least more than what other people have, have done. And that gets me more of what I might be looking for at, at a V1 level, right? When like it comes back, you're like, oh, okay, good. We're not, you know, completely off base here. We have one more question, but I feel like this one's gonna be more relevant when you start talking about machine learning and AI specifically around topic classifications. So I'm gonna yeah. save that for the future, but onwards. Yeah, um, this is kind of going on from like how to talk to your developers. I wanted to talk about should all SEOs be developers? Are all SEOs developers? Um, there's kind of a current tech SEO trend of you should just become a developer, start, you know, learn Python, learn JavaScript. I'm not going to say I'm not 
guilty of this. I think everyone should learn Python because Python is fun. Um, but so let's answer the question of, do you need to code to be an SEO? Uh, and then talk about what kinds of doors learning to code can open. Um, I do wanna say, I don't think you need to code to be an SEO at all. Um, but I think learning JavaScript can be really useful, especially with the way that Google is currently leaning towards more uh, insights about UX and things like uh, the first content full paint and Core Web Vitals stuff, right? They're starting to look at U UX and UI more as ranking factors. Um, and learning to use JavaScript can really help your ability to make suggestions to fix these issues. Like you can say, you know, it looks like there's a heavy amount of JavaScript here, but if you understand JavaScript, it can help you be like, this is the bit you need to cut out. Um, like, and I think, I mean, even Google Analytics is a good example of something where Google Analytics is really heavy, but a lot of it isn't necessary to load on a page. <laughs> you can cut a lot of it out if you don't need all of the information. If you just want like, I, for my website, I have just page visits and landing pages. That's all the information I get from Google Analytics and it is cut. I have the entire Google Analytics package and it is cut down to like one line of code, right? Like you can make that kind of suggestion to a client if you have that experience. And then Python is really useful for like crunching data or look, if you are a solo SEO and you want to start looking at how to make different vendor tools be friends with each other, I would say use Python because Pandas and other libraries are really easy to get started with and make your data like just, you can just select, it's basically Excel with a rocket pack strapped to its back in a lot of ways. And the ways I've seen SEOs who don't think they can code use stuff like Excel. I'm like, you could definitely code. Like it's not magic, it's just, looking at the same document in a different way, right? But again, you do not need to code to be an SEO, right? Like it can help, but sometimes your time is better spent elsewhere. And that's why you have a DevOps team or that's why you have a friend who you can slide into their DMs and talk to about JavaScript. Like, SEOs have their own expertise and that expertise, I don't want to minimize it or say, you know, if you learn, don't learn to code, you're a worse SEO. Like, obviously, there are tons of SEOs who know nothing about code and do a really good job, right? But I want to say this also, I got into coding from SEO. SEO is like my base coding has, is a passion for me and I really love working on tools to understand SEO from a toolification standpoint. And it also really helps with your imposter syndrome if you're an SEO who gets into code because when you're an SEO, you see a lot of garbage and a lot of bad websites and you could be like, oh, I could definitely make better websites than this. Um, so that this is my... If you are someone who is interested in coding, but uh, like, I don't know if I'm going to be like able to do it or smart enough. You definitely are smart enough. Coding isn't like, it isn't as magic as I feel like some people make it out to be. It's quantitative thinking and that's, you, you, you're probably gonna be pretty good at it. I believe in you, audience out there. Um, so let's talk about how code can kind of help with content here um, and talk about how Google understands content, what you can do with vendors and what can you do at, as a, a solo person who might be learning to code, right? Um, 
we were talking about this earlier, you were talking about the featured snippets thing. I was like, ah, this is exactly kind of how to think about it is Google breaks down content and like looks at the structure of the page and looks at the structure of the content and uses links to figure out what pages are good and then uses data science and ML to kind of figure out a, is this sentence order, does it make sense to display as a featured snippet? Does it make sense with what we expect for this page? And it looks at things like entities and the knowledge graph to be like, how is this hooked into the greater web semantically? But Google is also bad at understanding content. I want to be explicit about that. It's It tries its best, but it's a bunch of robots and people write stuff real weird. So to analyze content as an individual or as a multi billion dollar company, uh, you need to get a bunch of content. You need to crawl and clean all of that content. You need to analyze that content, warehouse all of that data, and then display the results with good UX, um, which is hard. Like this is why you use external vendors because you don't need, like, again, you don't need to be the solo person doing all of this. But you can DIY some stuff. Um, you can scrape your own data. Uh, going back to like, should you learn to code? You can extract your own entities, regression analysis, use Python and pandas. And that is a good place to start looking at vendor data and your own data on your own terms, right? Okay, uh, and now we're getting around to the ML stuff. Um, like there are bad ways to use ML and SEO and there are good ways to use ML and SEO because there are bad ways to use ML and there are good ways to use ML. Uh, the, and so this is kind of getting to know this question, uh, which we can kind of bring up here. Um, Noah asked, what are you finding to be the limits of ML and AI in regards to understanding keyword and topic classification, especially multi-label classification? What is the right approach these days? Uh, so we we try a lot of different methods for keyword and topic classification and multi-label classification in at LSG. Um, and we, it really has depended on the client and the keyword corpus we're looking at. Uh, there are a lot of limits, obviously, um, because, because, but because some of these keyword corpi are so vast, we found that using ML has been really useful in classifying and separating keywords into different comps. Um, so like uh, we, we've used k-means, which is an algorithm that kind of clumps together data if it is related to each other. Um, we've used uh, models both that we ha have trained and untrained. So uh, for some of our keyword, our engagements, we will label a bunch of keywords, use that to train a model, a machine learning model, and then it'll go find things that are related to those keywords and bring them together under that label. And for some, we've just sped up a k-mean, unsupervised k-means, and it kind of figures it out itself. And both of these things, I think, have been real time savers for our analysts in some ways. Um, but they do also involve a human eye to like look over and see if the labels and the clusters make sense, if the if it has found a bunch of junk keywords and grouped them together 
then at least we have a junk category, but sometimes it'll have a bunch of different junk categories and then only one which has the keywords we actually want. And so you have to go back, finagle it, uh, look at how the data is structured and kind of uh, return, right? It's about having uh, understanding how the model works and like uh, repeatedly editing and fixing it a lot of the time. Um, and that's just because ML and AI are finicky fundamentally, right? Uh, they And creating custom models for different keyword corpi can be it, like, so sometimes you have to do that because there are different elements for every one. Like uh, keyword corpi with a bunch of different products is going to be different to one which has a bunch of different brands that are related but not products, right? I feel like that was a very rambly answer. I think the right approach is you still have to have that human intervention in a lot of ways. Um, I think there's still a lot of limitations. Uh, we, we're experimenting with a lot of the different algorithms that have come out in that are like the new fad in ML. And it it's a lot of difficult, there's difficulty behind it, like trying to get that focus. Um, and a lot of these new diff models have old problems still baked in. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, I, as somebody who also works in ML and AI regarding keyword and topic classification, I feel like at a high level, it's, it's too generic. Like that's, that's the problem with the current state of commodity classification. It's like, yeah, you can say that this is a product or that's an organization, but ultimately, you know, is that relevant? Like, probably not, right? And I think what Jess here, what you're talking about is like, okay, the specificity of the models come from custom human interpretation, which then needs to be added on. And of course, it just depends on like what, what you're working on, right? If you're, if you have a car directory website of manufacturers, you know, labeling everything manufacturer or product is like not that helpful. You kind of want to know, you know, make model that kind of that, like more granularity that ML AI models in a commoditized sense are just like going to not know or care about that because, you know, they weren't trained on that data set. So I agree. I feel like that's, that's the biggest problem that we see is just sort of like the specificity is that I mean, there's infinite permutations depending on, you know, the data that you're looking at and the outputs that you're looking for. So, you know, it's not that helpful to know that Google is an organization and San Francisco is a location. Um, yeah. And that's, that's kind of how the state of it all is because, right, MLAI is trying to take the entire human lexicon and boil it down to a few key categories. Whereas when we're doing data analysis, we might potentially be wanting to take like, you know, one species and to break it out into like, you know, a set of genomes. And then that's like, you know, AI and ML are just like, no, nah, we don't care about that yet. Yeah. And I mean, I think alongside that you can use pre-built models that are huge. Like I think Google's entity corpus is huge available uh, model that you can use on your, you can ping it with a word and it'll give you back what the entity related to that word is. But that's not useful necessarily for understanding a set of keywords that is very specific to you. Like, um, I think it's a lot better to create your own model if you can, and then understand, like after understanding your client, be like, I understand 
what the uh, what the kinds of keywords that this client is interested in. I understand these categories and I can categorize them. Um, so DIY, I think, is the best, I guess, is what it comes down to. Um, and then like algorithms have bias, um, which is part of the reason why I would say building your own is useful because then you can control the bias. Uh, they can get stuff really wrong, which is why you should have a human pair of eyes on everything, right? Um, but they can also do the boring stuff for you and find patterns that you might not be able to find. Um, so like going back to the example that uh, Noah pulled, uh, we were, how do you split keywords into types? You can label them all manually. You can label some of them and then train a model to label the rest. Or you can use an algorithm like k-means and get them to cluster themselves. And I think it's really interesting to compare uh, the clusters that you create from a manual model and the clusters you get from something like k-means because um, k-means and other machine learning algorithms can find patterns that you might not be able to find. And Google is also a big machine made of algorithms looking at data. And so sometimes it's useful to kind of look from a computer's point of view at the data and be like, is this the pattern that Google is picking up? Is this the pattern that Google can see that I cannot see as a person. And I think that's the really useful thing about toolification, about ML, about looking at data from this way as an SEO is we are getting a computer eye view of content that was made for humans. Uh, and that can really help with SEO efforts. Um, so I've gotten, to my conclusion slide, um, which is just like understanding how machines talk is really useful and is part of SEO, uh, but understanding how to code and do that kind of thing isn't necessarily a part of understanding computers and developers understand computers in a very different way to how SEOs do but having that communication and having those skill sets available, be it you trying it yourself or having a tools team to fall back on, that can really help create, help you find more information, find more patterns and improve your client's sites. Um, so yeah, that's, Kind of. That's the goods. No, no. Yeah. I, you know, I love it. I feel like I can relate to a lot of these things that you're bringing up with the biases and the, you know, working with, with devs. We have um, a couple of questions that have popped up. Jerry asks if it's hard to gauge what the, it's hard to gauge what the devs need sometimes. If I said to a developer, please find where the unused JavaScript is in the script on this page, is it on him to find out where the script is or is it on the dev? Uh, I think you can probably say, please find where the unused JavaScript is on this page. If your dev, if that's part of, your dev's job or if you're asking a developer who's a friend to look uh i don't think they necessarily need more information than that um this is uh there's an there's an xkcd that's like uh i create it's like creating an app to f find out if someone's in a national park will take 10 minutes and finding out if there's a bird in that park will take like five years and a million dollars of funding. Like, I feel like from outside a lot of the time, what is easy for code and what is really difficult for code doesn't make any sense. Um, so I, I totally understand 
not being able to gauge what a dev might need. Uh, but in this in this use case, in this, I think if you can give the most information you can, if you in this scenario, if you would say, I want to find the unused JavaScript so we can remove it and make the page faster, the dev should be able to do that. Um, with just that information. Um, like you shouldn't feel obligated to learn a whole new craft just to get what you need. Just give the information you can, what you want out of it. And um, if you have further information, like if you have like a web.dev link that says unused JavaScript, how to get rid of it, like that kind of thing that can also be helpful. Yeah, to, to add on to this specific point, I, I usually like to approach a dev with the, this, this mental model in my mind, which is like, hey, look, if I could wave a magical wand and get whatever I needed, this is what I would like to happen. And I feel like, then in this particular conversation, of course, assuming that the dev likes me, respects me, that kind of stuff, then they'll usually respond and be like, okay, from like a technical perspective, like, I don't think we can make, you know, A, B, C and happen, but, you know, we could give you maybe, you know, like A minus two and, you know, like D, and then I'd be like, oh, well, you know, like the reason why I would want that to happen is because of whatever, whatever. And then we'd work out more of a solution there. So I always approach it from just a complete stance of like, I don't know how technically complex this is, but in an ideal world, this is what I would like to occur. And then usually the dev will come back and be like, no, like, you know, a bunch of these things we can't do because, you know, that just takes like an inordinate amount of effort to get it like right or accurate, but we can do maybe this or that because, you know, your end objective is, is that something like that. So that's been helpful for me. Um, I actually have my own like interesting question off, off the top of my head. I'm like, okay, so, you know, you're building all of these internal tools. Like, can you share what's the most relevant or, you know, like highly used internal tool that you've, you guys do at, at local SEO guide, maybe, you know, just at a high level, like, is it data warehousing and, you know, like piping in a bunch of stuff into a database and, you know, doing ML on that? Is it, you know, something where it's stitching together, you know, disparate data sources and giving somebody a chart to visualize some, some of the, the higher level mistakes that might be going on with their website. You know, what's like the thing that you find your, like the, the recipe that you find yourself kind of dishing out the most these days, if you're open to sharing. Yeah, I mean, I can talk about, we, we warehouse and kind of pipe a bunch of data together, um, which are, uh analysts can oh our web intelligence program the analysts pipe it into google data studio so they can see um and they do that with uh with this clustering effort we have they they can see how like different keyword groups and different parts of a website perform and that kind of like they can see that kind of information pretty easily um and we do uh we we have a bunch of utility tools we run a lot of it through jarvis which is just a slack utility that people can kind of ask Java. you know it's jarvis um like iron man jarvis so you can ask jarvis for like keyword data from, um, or um, like, I think, yeah, just getting different keyword data from different places is a big one. Um, we're building some stuff to automate and pipe some of our 
the content uh, team wants, you know, they want to be able to see their clear scope data and their SEM rush data in front of them for a client. So we're piping stuff together to so they can just at a glance see like this is the SEM rush keyword set. This is who's ranking there. This is the clear scope. Like here are all the things that clear scope sees um, so that they can be far quickly create or like quickly at a glance see all of this information and to create content and content briefs. Yeah. Um, uh, we have a tool that like you put in keywords, it pulls out the URLs ranking for the keywords and then you those URLs go back in and it finds all of the keywords that those URLs are ranking for. So you kind of get this big keyword corpus of like, this is all the stuff that Google thinks is to do with this keyword and like, into linking it um a tool that i made recently uh that has found a lot of use is i made a laundromat just to clean out data sources just to scrub stuff because i feel like everyone who works in seo knows like if you look at a big keyword corpus you're going to get a lot of garbage data <laughs> um yeah so uh yeah no i feel yeah. i figured there'd be like the majority that i can imagine is just stitching together all these disparate data sources and and drawing insights from them i feel like yeah a natural thing if you know you know which grouping of keywords is is doing well then you know what potentially your low-hanging fruit is from like a website's topical authority right it's like oh if this set of categorical keywords is doing really well launching more content in that specific realm of categorization is likely to land a lot easier on the front page top three spots of google whereas right if you know that you know this other set of content is not doing well then you could potentially you know get into link building or you know, in like figuring out your internal structures to like give more, lend more credibility to that set of pages. And I guess you could do a lot with um, all that, all that stuff, but it's also so, so like custom and dependent on a client by client needs, which is why, right. It's like inter or a local SEO guide. You just build all of these. So like, you know, think through one really large e-commerce website, which is going to be radically different from like a, like a media website or something like that, right? Yeah, um, we like we we do a lot of hands-on. We do some not a lot of hands-on stuff, but we do some hands-on stuff to kind of uh, depending on the size of the site. Like like you said, big e-commerce sites have a very different set of needs to like a mom and pop shop, um, and I think. Uh, analysts are empowered to ask for different things for different clients because we have a lot of interfacing with them which I think is really useful like being able to hear what they need is useful right um I, I was gonna answer Noah's questions please, here about please go <laughs> uh, I do like k-means uh, we just we tend to use the elbow method um uh which is just it's a it it is basically you create a, a graph very basically extremely basically you create a graph and then you see where the drop off is and that is the number of clusters that you uh might want for a k-means cluster um and yeah we use the elbow method usually um i I, I, sometimes we will use the elbow method to find the number of clusters and then uh, kind of come back to it after seeing the results and maybe be like, oh, maybe we want another cluster, maybe we want fewer clusters, like, uh, but that's part of the conversation you have with your code, right? Um, yeah, that totally. was my... Yeah, 
Awesome. I'm going to finish it off with one last question. You, you said you kind of like stumbled into code as a result of like search engine optimization. Any recommendations on, you know, how you got started, what you would recommend if somebody is, is in SEO and they, they wanted to, to try their hand at a little bit of code? Um, the first thing I want to say is I, I was into the idea of coding and I did a lot of coding tutorials for about five years while I was doing SEO. Um, and I didn't consider myself someone who could code. I was just in, I was fully stuck in tutorial hell. Um, the thing that kind of broke me through it was I wanted to use, <laughs> I wanted to use, uh, I wanted to be able to uh, see if I could automate adding captions and alt text to images. So the only ways I could find to do that, they didn't have tutorials for, so I had to go and ask the questions and do Googling. And um, I made a very janky cut, garbage piece of python i put it together but i was so proud of it because i'd done it without i hadn't had to look at tutorials i hadn't had to look like um i i had i didn't have like i had looked at some other people's code but i hadn't had to copy anything like it was very like and that was i was like oh i love this I could do this the whole time, but I felt like I would break something. So I would say like tutorials are fine using stuff like Code Academy or Free Code Camp or whatever, that's fine. But really the thing will break you through is being like, I want to have this tool exist. I want to see this and then trying to do it yourself. Um, totally, totally. All right, we have one more question from Noah. Are you finding that human intervention is necessary in most multi-step processes to verify that the data looks right, that kind of stuff? Does that process ever end? Um, <laughs> the process ends when it looks right. Uh, I think that's, I, there are, there are smaller data sets where we don't have to like check and there are times where we don't necessarily have to check because we're sure enough in our code that it will probably look fine but we tend to always check anyway and have human verification because uh, like even the best machines are fallible like um i mean we can take google as an example right uh, they have spent the last 20 years refining and refining their search system um, and trying to make sure it doesn't surface stuff like hate speech, doesn't create these connections that are really offensive or incorrect. And you still, all the time, you can search for something and something will come up that is incorrect or offensive or garbage. <laughs> um, and there is no, I don't think there's a real way for Google to, to do that kind of verification properly themselves. Um, but for us as a like small agency that cares about our clients and like cares about our data, having someone check, trust but verify, right? Like we having someone check stuff out and be able to call an alarm is important. Yeah, totally, totally. We, we have some of these things where, you know, when we're testing different algorithms, my, my co-founder just kind of kicks over these like Excel CSV spreadsheets and it's just sort of like better or worse. And then uh, no, he's like, <laughs> yeah, better, worse, flat. <laughs> yeah, that's, it's, a, it's like kind of a nonstop process. I would say in, like in alignment with just this going thought uh, at a very high level, 
we say the presence of one bad result is infinitely, not infinitely, but like 10 times worse than the presence of many good results. And that's just, I think, the, the way that human behavior works. It's like, if you see something that's like sorely wrong, right? If there's like, you know, one orange tree in a field of apple trees, you'll be like, why is that there? Whereas you're yeah. not like in a field of apple trees, like, wow, that one just looks way more majestic and the fruit produced <laughs> by it is like way better. So yeah. we're always like checking for, okay, the presence of one dramatically worse result and always trying to build our algorithms to defend against the presence of, of that. Yeah, um, and like GPT-3, which is the most advanced language algorithm, like even they, that ha replicates the biases of the internet. So if you're using it to build anything, it's going to have bits which, do the same thing like you really like you you yeah. is that you've got to create your algorithms defensively with that kind of stuff in mind right totally totally well thank you so much jess this was an awesome presentation i i loved it thoroughly thank you all for attending and tune in next time for whatever webinar we might have in store take care bye take Later, care y'all thank you